All right, guys, let's get started. Uh, we're super excited today to have Jim McCollum and Jeff Carpenter from Datastacks to come give a talk uh, today about uh, the new Astra Cassandra as a service uh, product that they put out uh, in, in the last year. So they're here to talk about you know, what was the process of doing that, taking an existing NoSQL system and, and making it run in the cloud as, cloud as a service. Uh, Jeff is the head of, of sorry, teaching relations at CMU or, or sorry, at, at, at DataStacks. What was your title again? Yeah, I'm leading up the learning teams. Okay. And then uh, Jeff is the VP of Cloud Engineering at DataStacks, where he's been here since, since 2018. So again, uh, the way we'll do this is uh, if you have any questions, just unmute yourself, uh, announce who you are, where you're coming from, and then ask your question and interrupt at any time. Okay? All right, guys. Uh, Jim, go for it. Cool. Um, so, yeah, like I said, uh, Jim McCollum, uh, VP of Cloud Engineering here at Datastax. Uh, been here since 2018. Uh, cloud Engineering is really responsible for Astra, which is our database as a service. Our internal cloud platform and slash platform as a service that we have. Um, the whole point of that is to give us the ability to actually get code out into the wild um, and, and onto, onto the, the various cloud systems in a, in a consistent manner. Um, it's our Kubernetes integration teams. Um, they're primarily responsible for the operators that we're building right now, but they're really deep into the Kubernetes project and really understanding how do we integrate best as a database? Um, it's, it's actually not the best system in the world to deploy stateful applications on top of, and, and having folks that understand that pretty, pretty well is, is important to our success at this point, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, obviously, we have the Cloud DB team, which I'll talk a little bit about, but their job is really to adapt Cassandra to be more cloud native. Um, we have a cloud special projects team, um, and I'll introduce one of the projects that they're working on towards the end. And then our cloud SRA team, who's really responsible for when things go wrong, getting in and figuring out what it is. Um, we, we put a lot of work into the operator and two remediations, but sometimes things go poorly and we need folks to get in and really understand what's going on and fix it, um, and then help us build new remediations for that in the future. Um, I was actually previously a cloud a data stacks uh, customer. Before I came here, I was at Lending Club and we had actually purchased um, DSE. Uh, I was looking for a cloud product and it didn't exist at Datastax at the time. And then the role popped up on the website and I said, this is definitely what I want to do with my life is come in and build the product that I wanted to buy in the first place. So that's, that's how I got here. Um, I've been in engineering and data leadership roles in a bunch of places from hospitals to biotechs to Amazon to GE. So Lots of different uh, different types of exposure, not just a pure database background. Um, and I live out here in Berkeley, California with my family. And uh, yeah, my LinkedIn details are at the bottom. So you can hit me up there if you want afterwards. Um, and then Jeff. All right. Um, yeah, I've been uh, doing a bunch of different things in my three years here at Datastax. Um, I got involved in the Cassandra community about six years ago when I started uh, use, as a user of Cassandra and an architect um, on a project that was building a new reservation system in the cloud uh, on AWS for choice hotels. Um, and I uh, got the opportunity to update the O'Reilly book on, on Cassandra. Uh, which uh, brought me into the orbit of um, some great people at Datastax, Patrick McFadden and others. Um, so anyway, I ended up joining developer relations team. Um, I'm, right now, I am leading the different learning teams that we have that are, are producing our training and certification programs and our, the new developer part of our website, datastax.com slash dev, which has a, a lot of fun embedded uh, training scenarios with it. If you guys have seen Katakoda, and that uh, terminal-based stuff, it's pretty fun. So that's what I do. And my contact information, I think, just flew by there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so anyway, if you, if you want to uh, get connected with me, um, the, the one fun fact I'll share about uh, the cloud product is um, I was trying to figure out what Datastack's market strategy was when I was talking to them. And then uh, they announced uh, the, the development of like the acquisition of a company that was to be the first version of a, as a service product. I think that'll come in a little bit of the history here. 
But when, when they did that acquisition, I was like, oh, I get it. I get what the strategy is of this open source company. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do this now. Um, and I think that's where maybe Jim can <laughs> the jumping off point for this, uh, great, this great story of the past couple of years. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. And sorry about that. I'm really bad at slides on a Mac. For some reason, I can just skip through the whole thing if I really try. Um, so yeah, I wanted to go through, I'm not traditionally like a, a database person, kind of like I alluded to. It's more of a building big cloud platforms. And so I wanted to go through this more from the direction of, you know, yes, we've done some interesting things with the database, but how do we build this huge ecosystem up around it? And what was the journey to get there and some of the some of the pitfalls that we fell down um, and, and how we got around them and how we progressively improved the product and how it not just you know made the cloud product better, but data stacks and Cassandra in general as we went through that. So um, so basically, uh, Jeff alluded to it in, in his intro that in the beginning, there was a cloud product that we had acquired uh, about a year before I got here. And um, it was spaghetti at its finest. Um, it was a big Ruby on Rails stack. Um, every one of these arrows like did something different and it was one big callback stack. And if one piece failed, it would take three or four hours of an engineer's time to go back and try and trace where everything went wrong because all it would take is one callback to fail and we would have to go through all of the logs and all of the systems to figure out where it had failed and where it had gotten stuck. Um, it also made updates extremely difficult. Um, so it was, it was a very, very painful system to work with. Um, so this is what things looked like when I got in here. Um, basically what it would do is <clears throat> we would have a customer and they would come to us and we would have a white glove service where they would, we would send them a AWS cloud formation script, which would take care of peering their VPC back to our system where we would then install DSC with Elk and Prometheus and Ops Center and all the rest of the pieces that, that really made DSE a product um, and then start monitoring that product. Um, it wasn't a lot of fun. It was invariably the admin on the cluster uh, on the customer side would run this script. Something would go wrong. We would have to get an engineer involved on their side or they would have to get an engineer and we would have to get an engineer and they would talk and figure out where the, why this peering failed and where there was where things got stuck. And it was just not a lot of fun. Um, we onboarded a few customers like this. Um, ultimately, it wasn't super successful. Um, so we, my next step was to or basically make this stable. How do, we, how do we take this thing and make it stable progressively without rewriting the whole thing from the ground up? Um, so we moved into this contained spaghetti phase, like a canned spaghetti, where it was we you know, took best practices, took the user experience, took all the control plane, packaged that up in a Kubernetes environment um, with microservices and you know, Envoy and all, all, the, all the best practices in cloud native development and, and really packaged that into what is the purple layer there. Um, so that made things a lot easier. It was a lot cleaner. There was still death and destruction down below, but at least the part that the user interacted with was isolated and wouldn't completely fail in front of the user. Um, we also changed the model pretty appreciably where we would actually deploy into a VPC of our own um, that data stacks had control over. So we would push into this VPC and it was still a pretty heavy deployment, but it was three DSE instances or Cassandra instances, Ops Center and LCM, which is our provisioning and management tooling. Um, but then we, we had really our first new feature for Astro, uh, which was we built a driver endpoint service. And the reason we wanted to do that is traditionally when you're using a cloud database, getting connected to it is very difficult. You either have to go through VPC peering or you have to use a specialized connection or just an invariable number of ways that you need to do networking magic to make that happen to do development on a laptop. Um, and, and first and foremost, our goal was really to make it easy to get started developing on top of Cassandra. So we actually built this new driver endpoint that, that was able to take Cassandra um, uh, wire protocol 
and translate it and pass it back to the appropriate uh, instances behind the, behind the scenes. But that wouldn't be safe um, because people with bad passwords with low entropy would in putting those things directly on the internet isn't safe. So what we actually did was made it an MTLS um, connection. So on the Astra experience, and it still exists today, you can go in and it will give you a secure connect bundle. And the data stacks drivers for Cassandra actually use that secure connect bundle to uh, set up an MTLS connection back through Astra for you so that it's really only two lines of code. Because traditionally with Java, that type of getting MTLS working is a lot of switches on the command line and probably 20 or 30 lines of boilerplate code. And we actually smashed that into the driver itself and made it, made it very convenient. Um, so, Jim, yeah. Pretty, like this is pretty deep in the weeds. Like what are we actually looking at? This was, this was, this is your, the over level, the overview architecture of the data stacks enterprise product, which was a packaged version of Cassandra and, and, Something Good else. point. Sorry. Yeah. So um, if we look up at the top, what's in the box is really, this is the control plane for the service itself. Um, this is the UI and the services that actually orchestrate the deployment of the databases themselves. So if you, if we're looking at the databases, the original version is this lower, the box in the lower left corner here. And the new version would be the deployment in the right corner over here. Whereas this one was in the customer environment, this one was in a hosted environment that we were able to take care of on our own. Right, so, um, so this, this, this is somebody, so again, somebody has an existing Cassandra deployment and they want to switch over to use the managed one that you're providing or like? No, this is all net new. Okay. I need a Cassandra database. Um, okay. I want to I wanna come in and run a Cassandra database and click a button and make that okay. happen. And I, I mean, I, out of curiosity, why do you have both Postgres RDS and MySQL RDS in, in your backend like control plane? Good point. Um, these came. Um, so everything that in the Rails stack over here on the, on the right-hand side, that was what came through the acquisition process. Got it, okay. Um, the IDP, uh, this is really for our SSO solution. We use a, com a commercial slash OSS project for this, uh, yeah. Red Hat's Key Cloak product, and that does not work with NoSQL yet. Um, we've looked into it, and it's, uh, it's not optimized for that type of pattern yet. Um, it, it's definitely something we want to do as a uh, Skunk Works project at some point, but there are some pretty specific um, searches and such that would, aren't super compatible with, with Cassandra at this point. Uh, we think probably with our new storage attached, attached indexing, we might be able to make it happen, but it just, in, in the spirit of moving fast, this doesn't seem like a place where we would optimize at this point. Uh, Got it, okay. Any other questions I can answer about this slide? It's gonna, there's gonna be less arrows and less boxes as I go. It's, it's, the goal is to, we're gonna get more consolidated as we go here. Okay, no, I think it's good. Cool. Um, so th that, that step worked. Um, we got to about six months in, unfortunately the rails application that was underlying everything had about a 20% failure rate, which mean meant every time we would have to do something about, you know, roll, basically roll a die and it would, you probably like you land on one, it's going to fail. Um, so we were faced with the option of going through the rail stack and trying to fix it or re rewriting it. And, and we chose the latter. Um, and we took that whole rail stack and basically baked it into this blue box here. So we took all of the functionality and all of those callbacks and all of those services and really made somewhat of a monolith microservice out of all of it that handles the entire orchestration of, of, putting down the database itself um, and, and getting everything pushed out. And I'm the top here, this is when we migrated onto um, Keycloak for our SSO. These, these front end services are really what drive the user experience. These are other projects inside of data stacks. So the, the idea was when I spoke about the platform as a service, 
when when I arrived at DataStax, we were very much a tarball company. Um, we ship we we built versions of DataStax Enterprise Cassandra, and we ship them as tarballs. Um, but for this type of rollout, we really need a way to get software onto the internet very quickly. Um, and so we actually built this PaaS service that allows anybody internally to build an application and get it out on top of the on top of the cloud platform very easily with full CI CD, integrated testing. Um, getting it into a Kubernetes environment without having to stress about needing to really know anything about Kubernetes. So if you go into most of the bigger, bigger cloud providers or places like Amazon or Google or, or Microsoft, they have these type of systems set up. You walk in day one, there's a way to deploy path. It's a happy path and it's all paved. And we've been, we've been kind of paving that road as we went internally here. So that, was, that is really the point of the big top box. The important part at the bottom here is the we consolidated everything into this one box um, and pushed infrastructure provisioning into this other box. And what that would do is all the requests that would come in, this would handle all of the orchestration about pushing it out. It would use a workflow engine to make sure that we got through. A, we had a, a big dag of different steps to roll this out um, on different cloud providers and through different types of VMs. Um, but Really the big net add after this is we, we actually started working with Kubernetes and we built in our command processor. And the goal of the command processor is to keep, to keep people's hands out of the customer environments. Um, so the goal is, is that if, if we need to do something inside of a customer environment regularly, we want one thing to do it. I don't want engineers logging in and SSHing in and typing commands and fat fingering things and dropping somebody's table, right? We want, we want like a clean set of, it's essentially a, a recipe book of things to do on a cluster, whether it's scale up, scale down, remediate some action where the node may be in a fail state and we have to bring it back, um, perform repairs against the database. So what it does is it actually takes commands off of a queue um, from the orchestrator service here, executes those commands, and then puts the response back onto the queue again. So we have this like, command and control loop between every single instance that keeps us from having to log into it. It also stops us from having to SSH into these systems. So we use these queues as really asynchronous mechanisms for being able to push commands out to our clusters. Um, and so it gives us, gives us the ability to affect many, many boxes or many, many environments all at one time, um, as so opposed what's, to- what's, it, what's an example of a command, like bring up you know, latest version of something or install this package? Yeah, install this package. If we've, if we've given you the recipe for the package, um, other things would be scale up. So we would, we would normally deploy, the first step of the deployment would deploy with three nodes and three different AZs. The next step would be if the customer needs to scale, okay, let's provision out three more nodes. Let's install Cassandra on those nodes. Let's attach them to the cluster and make sure they're in a good state. If anything goes into a bad state, send a command back so an engineer gets a message that something broke and we, we need to break glass and get into that environment. Um, it could be the node is not responding, so try and restart the node. Um, run repairs against that node. Perform a backup, like a, a point in time backup for that node. Um, so basically all the, the, all the various things that you would have to do, but without having to actually log into the environment. And that, out of curiosity, what's the back end of the queue, Kafka? Uh, actually, it's, it's, everything is on uh, AWS, so we just use SQS. Yep, yep, yep. So we have actually one SQS queue for every single um, customer environment, so they subscribe to their own queue. And then we have a, a shared queue for everything that goes back. The, and so we can scale up the orchestrator service to actually handle more load and, and process more more messages if we need to. Um, we've never needed to do that yet from that perspective. It's, it's pretty good at, at with just the three to six nodes that run normally, but as we add more customer environments, we will start getting more information back. Um, we've also not had a storm of, of activity. If something goes horrible on AWS, I'm expect, if we lose like a full AZ, I'm expecting a storm of messages to come in that say I'm, something bad happened. I'm trying to reinstate and another AZ. So, um, 
Um, so yeah, what, these improvements, so where do we get? Um, much better reliability. We got down to a tenth of a percent of failure rate from 20, so that was pretty good. Still not exactly where I want things to be, but it was way, way better. Um, we got full CI CD pipelines for all um, development. So at this point, you know, we're pushing thousands of times a week um, through the CI CD pipeline. So it really is a continuous flow of, of, of changes and remediations. So it's not just, yeah, engineers have it great. They can push code and it goes out, but it's also when things go poorly, we can get a fix out very, very quickly. Um, we had a slight brownout situation a couple weeks ago where we pushed a piece of code and it didn't do very well in front of about 1400 people at the time. And it was about five or six minutes and we had, we figured out what it was, had it patched and it had a new code push out to the production environment. Actually, out of curiosity, how long, like if your CI pipeline, how long does that actually take? Depends on whether it's an emergency or not. Um, so if it's not an emergency, it takes about three or four hours because right. we actually push it through we haven't gotten to the point where I want to be, which is when you push a front end change, it only tests the front end framework. It actually just goes through and does a full regression every time we push everything out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so we want to get to a point with enough mocks in place where we can trust that we, if we exercise the front end environment with the mocks, then the front end can just go right out immediately. And if we push the orchestration, then that can go out without having to exercise the entire infrastructure provisioning pipeline every time we don't change that part okay and then but then but like updates to cassandra like the core cassandra like runtime that's a that's a separate ci pipeline that's a separate pipeline um okay. and, and that one is actually a combination of ci and manual um we're getting better at that okay but that's one that the blast radius if something goes off the rails there is incredibly large um, of course yes so that one I want people monitoring when it goes out. And so we, we actually, we've identified cohorts of, of databases that we will phase it out through. Um, so first is, first is we have a cohort of individuals who are on the team and we will push out to them first. And then the next ring is Datastax employees. And the next ring is free tier databases that are not <laughs> getting a lot of access. And then there's free tier databases that are getting a lot of load. And then there's finally people who pay us money. Um, yes. And so, and so we, we progressively tier these out so that if there is a, if there is an impact, it's, it's contr controlled. And Where we aren't at at this point is the, okay, we feel super comfortable without running these set of manual scripts that we're just going to kick off the next step. So it's each, each ring is a different run and it's a different set of eyeballs and, people being progressively more nervous. Okay, let's say best case scenario, what, what is that? How long is that that, 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 that deployment cycle that goes through uh, all the rings? We just did 3000 clusters in about three hours the other day. Okay, wow, that's impressive, okay. So yeah, it's it's getting, and and part of that's due to the, yeah, I'll get to the, how we, how we got to that part and why it's way easier than it used to be. Uh, I think there was uh, maybe an implied question in there from Andy. Maybe I'm reading between the lines too much, but I think what, what about what version of Cassandra is actually running on the nodes? That was not my implied question, but that's a good question too. Oh, okay. So well, we, we can are, start that question if you don't want to. <laughs> we are, we're running right now. We're running data stacks enterprise. Um, the, the same version that we package for data stacks customers. Um, we're waiting for the Cassandra 4.0 release to come out before we um, put Cassandra itself as an option, um, mostly because we're not, we're not as sure about the operational characteristics of the 3.1 release and having two versions out there and a soon to be three once 4.0 released would mean that my SRE team would have to be familiar with three different versions of Cassandra. Now, since 4.0 is really where we've stated as a company that we're moving towards, they need to get used to it. So it's, it, we want to get it out there and, and start using it, but getting them trained on 3.11 and understanding the operational characteristics and where it goes off the rails just felt like that was a, little, a bridge a little bit too far for the first version here. Cool. Um, the other thing we built in is a 
this version of DSE is actually somewhat customized. We went through and made some pretty fundamental changes. Some of those have been backported into the 6.8.1 release, but some have not yet. Uh, the one that has made it in is uh, the guardrails. So we've put in some guard. Cassandra is notorious for letting you do whatever you want and then failing. Um, for a database as a service, that's not super awesome. So we want it. We want something out there that that is is stable and runs and is hard for the customer to bring down due to you know doing things they probably shouldn't. So limits on column sizes. Um, it would allow you to put a gigabyte worth of data in a column for every single row. And that's just, it'll, you can try and read the whole table and it will just page it all out and you'll run out of memory and it'll just fall over. So we got rid of those, those, type, of, those type of failure scenarios as well as you know, number of indexes and, and other, uh, other specific tuning uh, for the environment that we're running in just to make sure that if a user who's not familiar with Cassandra tries to do something, it doesn't bring the whole database down with it or even bring a node down with it. Um, and we're, we're, we're constantly improving those. Um, we got full tenant isolation, which is great. Ops automation through that, the, the command and control loop there with the queues, um, centralized monitoring and alarming. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't all great yet. Um, we had a pretty large stack, that bottom right corner, there was a lot going on in there. Um, we would run into cloud provider limits pretty quickly. We needed all these IP addresses and all of these boxes and all of these DNS entries. And so um, the cloud providers themselves actually put limits on, say, the number of IP addresses that you can have in an individual AWS account. So we actually have to shard across the accounts. You can only get so many EC2 instances of a certain type. And so the more of those things that exist in the customer, the customer environment means that that stack gets more complicated and, and our, we have a higher probability of running into limits, which means we just run straight into a wall full speed because trying to query these limits, they don't actually have APIs around all of them. So some of them you just like run into a wall and you'll get an error back and it'll be like, oh crap, we're out of DNS entries again. And so now we have to like, get on the phone with AWS, get them to give us some more DNS entries. And so now we had to build in this idea of not just sharding like databases, but we have to shard across accounts. So we actually have like a ring of database servers that exist in the world out there. So, so and, and, and Amazon knows that like, oh, this, these are like 20 data stacks accounts. And I guess they don't care because you pay them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, it was, and it wasn't 20. It was actually, we went through a phase where we would do an account per customer or a, yeah. an account per user. And that got up to something around 700, I think. So they were, then it got to the point where it was just impossible for us to actually see what was going on in the world. And we moved back down and consolidated into these sharded accounts. But we can, once we start running into the limits, we'll add a new account. It'll get put into the, the buffer of available accounts and then we'll try and balance we'll provision into that one until it meets the limit of the other ones and so there's a little bit of art which is do we feel like we're getting close to the limits and then there's science of okay as we add these things fill them up progressively and then spread it out across the top again so sharding aws accounts i've never heard this this is awesome <laughs> It was pain. It's, it's incredibly painful. Yeah. Um, the sharding is actually really good. But before that point, I would probably spend, it would be engineering weeks devoted to just running into these, running into these walls and trying to fix them. Uh, and then, yeah, we would also have reliance on Op Center and LCM, which are another set of tooling that just has to run in another environment constantly. And there's a lot of cost. The more boxes you run, the higher, higher, the cost are that we have to pass on to our users, which just doesn't work. Um, and so along came Google, um, and it, this was about a year ago, um, May of last year, Google came around and said, and this is about when Amazon was just got in trouble for um, putting out their document DB, which was the direct clone of uh, Mongo and the, the Kafka clone. And so um, Google decided to take a different tact, which was work with the OSS vendors and pull them in as the providers on GCP and not try to fight them or clone them, or actually, but actually like bring them in and bring the community with them. Um, and so 
we were invited to be part of the first cohort of this with Elastic and Confluent um, for Elastic and then for Kafka. And um, one of the things that they strongly suggested we should do is move towards Kubernetes as a rollout environment. Um, this was right when Anthos had been announced, and so they were they were really excited about Kubernetes for everything on the planet. Um, and so we took that as a, this is something that my team had wanted to do for a very long time, but we had just not had the air cover or the, the budget to do it, and now we are allowed to actually pursue this. So we actually went out and... Um, built this capability for Kubernetes to deploy Cassandra, something that had existed through several operators out there, um, but not none of them were really built for mass consumption. So we started working with Helm Charts, um, and, and Helm Charts worked okay, but Helm Charts didn't really give us the ability to build smarts into what it does. Um, what, is, so what, is, what is Helm Charts, sorry? So Helm Charts are kind of like RPMs for... Kubernetes rollouts. It's it's a packaged way of deploying an application. It just it explains all the parts, all the different containers, how they tie together. But it doesn't have any, just like an RPM package, it gets it down, but it doesn't have a lot of smarts in it. The difference between that and the Kubernetes operator is the operator is actually a process that runs alongside the rest of the Kubernetes containers and keeps everything in line. So it will actually go out and poke at all of the different pods and make sure that they're operating correctly, check for metrics. So you can build smarts into this thing that says, okay, when, when throughput exceeds a certain amount or when, it, when we look like we need to do too many, like there's a backup of hints or a backup of repairs, either perform this action or reach out and alert the, uh, the human operator or the, the database system that we need to do something uh, to remediate this. So it's really the difference between between an install and a somewhat expert system that can help us administrate and keep these systems running. So we went on and did that and it actually turned out really, really well. Um, and this was really fundamental around what you had asked before about how fast it is to update. It's when we want to update a system, we build a new Docker, uh, new Docker container, we push it out and then we just go out and tell all of the databases to go and update themselves to the latest version they pull it down. The operator is smart enough to incrementally roll through each one, update that one, make sure that it's it's rejoined the ring again, make sure that it's healthy, and then move on to the next one. And so we can we can really just it, it's you know point fire forget um, a lot of times, and then just go back around and check. So we have we also have a, instances of deep pings that we can run into the environment that tell us if the environment is sane or not. So once this is done, we actually, these those deep pings are constantly reporting to us. It's how we know whether we stay with an SLA or not, and they'll go through and check all of the endpoints. If everything's up, great. If it's not, somebody gets alerted because with, with you know four nines, that gives us, if we're down for an hour every month with four nines, we've missed our SLA. Um, that's 99.986, which is not four nines. So um, it's important to get somebody on top of that really, really quickly. So this is, this is the, the complete evolution from like a really, really messy stack to something that's really nice and clean that takes care of itself on deployment. Um, so yeah. We, this forced us into building the operator, which is great. Um, and we're, we dog food it constantly. Like, if this thing doesn't work, then we're in trouble from a cloud perspective. So we've released it open source to the community. It's tested thoroughly. It continues to get tested and improved and refined. Um, it gives us faster provisioning, gives us faster updates, gives us faster lifecycle events on each cluster. We've deployed over 25,000 clusters with it so far. Um, it's you know both clusters that people are using and plus through that CI CD pipeline of testing the whole loop beginning to end. Um, it allowed us to deploy our graph and our GraphQL and REST endpoints very easily. Before we would have just this environment for the front end that was in its own Kubernetes cluster. And then we'd have those three other DSE clusters behind that. And then we'd have the LCM and Ops Center nodes behind that. And so we were talking something like six or seven individual um, VMs at that point. 
Now we launch on three. Um, we make sure that they're appropriately sized and everything just gets squeezed into those three boxes. And when we need to upgrade, we just upgrade them all at one time. Um, and we push, we need to scale. The front end scales um, immediately with the back end. Uh, one of the things we want to do as an improvement when we when a user, we finally find a user with a very mismatched workload is allow for the ability to scale out the, the GraphQL and REST endpoints independently of the database itself so we can we can handle more load potentially on the front end and balance that out against very large databases on the back. Um, so we want to be able to to uh, to, to um, provide that feature out. It also allowed us. How to, often does that? How often does that happen? Where like the the, the GraphQL you know front end is 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 the bulk of the time you're spending for 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 a database system? Right now, none. Okay. Um, most of the people who are using the database right now are Cassandra natives, so they're they're really going through the CQL interface. We are, we're actively, the reason around GraphQL and REST is really to help attract a new, a new breed of developer that doesn't want to mess around with drivers or sure. MTLS or anything else, right? So uh, at some point, just due to probably the serialization aspects of, of yeah. GraphQL and REST that they're going to need more memory. They're just they're going to have a different JVM characteristic than the database will. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that makes sense. So, um, it also allowed us to bring along. Um, we now have uh, you can bring your own KMS. So, if you don't trust data stacks with your keys for your data, bring your own. We can encrypt your data with your own keys. We got VPC peering now, multi key space. Um, we we actually limited the ability to add key spaces because in in Cassandra, you, when you add a key space, you're allowed to set a whole bunch of parameters around how that key space performs. Some of those are bad from a performance standpoint. It also allows you to do things like set the replication factor, which is just, we don't want people to set the replication factor to one and then wonder why their database goes down. So we had to actually build some mechanisms in to allow for multiple key spaces. So we've, we've released that code uh, as well. Um, and so, all of this led to where we are now, which is we've actually taken Cassandra fully multi-tenant at this point. Um, our free tier right now is running uh, across about 17 Kubernetes, very large Kubernetes nodes um, with about 3,700 databases out there. So we, we've actually, we've taken the operator to the next level, which allows us to squeeze a lot of these free tier databases into a very small space, um, which it's it's good from a cost control standpoint. When we're putting up free databases, having to pay for them every month is is somewhat untenable in the long term. <clears throat> it also allows us to to start testing out where we want to go with this, which is paid multi tenant tiers. Um, trying everybody can agree that having a replication factor of three across three AZs is really good. It's also really expensive. Um, it's about 1800 bucks a month. And, and you know, for your average Cassandra user, that's not a lot of money. But if we're going towards an adoption curve and trying to get people who are, you know, they, they're okay with an RDBMS, they're okay with an Amazon RDS, they just want a little bit more stability and they want more scale, better scalability and better reliability, 1800 bucks is a lot. Um, so we want to get to the point where we can give all of those characteristics, but in a cheaper, easier to use package that, you know, these people don't need seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 transactions per second. They need like a hundred. And so there's no way to do that really in a cost effective manner without, without this, this path. And, and so far we rolled this out about two and a half weeks ago and it's operating really well. And this is, this is another one of the reasons we can roll an update so quickly. It really just goes out and hits a bunch of very, very small instances and gets them updated very quickly. So is a, is a free customer, is it, is it per container? Or is it, are, you, are you packing multiple free customers on a, on a single JVM? No, no. So everybody, everybody lives in their own container. There's full, there's full workload isolation. They have their own endpoints, they have their own uh, command processor, everything is, is very specific for that. It, we treat it like a regular, a regular Astra cluster. 
But in theory, you, you could do even further consolidation if, I mean, I, I don't know what kind of uh, balance, internal balancing for Tennessee that Cassandra has, but in theory, you could pack, you know, again, I think it's unlikely that the free guys are even doing 100 transactions a second, right? They're probably doing one a minute. Yeah. Right? Like for these guys, you could pack them in a single JVM and that would save you, you'd have to do the math, but that, that could save you even more. It, yes, it could. The one problem though is the, the back pressure and, um, and the, the, the guardrails are not to the point where I would trust that for somebody who was giving us money. Meaning if there okay. wasn't, if there was a bad neighbor who was able to tear down, like knock the JVM off, then we could squeeze a bunch of people onto a single JVM, but all it takes is one, one bad actor to really just bring the whole thing down for everybody. Sure. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. With the container isolation, everybody gets their own slice of the CPU. They get their own little bit of memory. Um, if you're a jerk, then you're really just compromising your ability to do anything at that point. Uh, and and we, Kubernetes was firmly in our path at that point. And so that was, we felt that was the best way to solve this at this point, as opposed to trying to, to restrict, you know, bad actors or, or noisy neighbors directly on the JVM itself. That w that was definitely like a there was a long discussion on on the best the best path to go down there. Um, so yeah, what's next? Multi regions coming up uh, by the end of the month here. So support for Azure. Um, <clears throat> surprisingly enough, a year ago, if you would have asked me, I would have said GCP is most likely to be the next you know number two. But Azure has really come out of the gates, and they are cleaning up everywhere. So and Microsoft is really coming out as a dominant player in the cloud market. So we are, we are actively and aggressively charging towards that. Um, Kubernetes makes that a lot easier. Um, when we moved from GCP to AWS, it took about three weeks to make that change. Um, Azure is not as simple. Their APIs are not as, as clean and easy to use. All of my engineers have been saying that they're very peculiar um, and, and just they're unorthodox. And I think part of that is Microsoft has a very long history of supporting a very a deep level of regressions and supporting everything that they've ever done forever and ever. Um, and so which is great because they have a they have a much bigger enterprise base. Uh, Amazon will just tell you like, nope, we're going to deprecate this feature tough. Microsoft will just support it forever and ever, which leads to a little bit of weirdness. But we're getting around on that. Um, we're replacing the Cassandra secondary indexes with storage attached, attached indices. So actually building those into the SS tables themselves as opposed to outside of them and building it in consolidated across the cluster as opposed to on a per node basis. Um, this is new uh, code that Datastax is contributing back to the Cassandra community, but it's, a, it's enabled on every, um, it's enabled on every Astra instance today to try out, but it's not, it hasn't replaced the native secondary indexes yet. Um, we want to bring in pluggable authentication authorization, more regions, annual reserved usage, paid multi-tenant. Um, and then the next two things, um, these, these were the special projects I was talking about. One, um, we're working on serverless. Um, we're working on, on making Cassandra itself serverless. Um, and that is a team of about five or six of our, our best Cassandra engineers thinking about how we can separate out compute and storage in a way where we can make, we can make serverless a tenable and, and, and cost efficient model for getting Cassandra out there for everybody on the planet. So eventually, eventually we move away from this idea of even free tiers and we move to a model of ephemeral compute and in, in movable storage. So the idea that you can have a cold node and bring it up and bring it online within seconds <clears throat> to handle whatever the workload is. So if it is, you know, if it is that one or two requests an hour, it'll probably sunset and come back and sunset and come back. But if it's, you know, say one per second, then we'll just keep the workload running and be able to be more like a dynamo or a key spaces or a cosmos where we, we bill at the IOPS level and not at the keeping $1,800 worth of hardware up and running. Um, and so they're actually looking at where we can, where we can break the architecture and make it 
make Cassandra itself more distributed and more like a microservices based architecture and less like a big monolithic database. Um, and then the last thing is, you guys, I think, are the first people outside of data stacks to hear about this, but we've started working on a project called C2. And C2 is our reimagining of what the coordinator looks like for Cassandra. Um, it's very much an internal project at this point. We, we looked at what the coordinator did, and then we've also looked at where people have extended Cassandra in the past, data stacks included. And much of what we do is actually in the coordination tier. So if you look at integrations with Graph and, um, GraphQL and REST, things like integration with Kafka as an input, the pluggable authentication, transparent decryption and encryption, row level access control, read repairs, joins, the ability to, to output um, events to external systems like Kafka or Spark or any other streaming system or push out a CDC. Every single one of these things ties directly in at the coordinator layer. So we've actually reimagined the coordinator as a somewhat of a very mini app server um, that we can build in a processing pipeline on top of to tie in new new handlers to handle these things like transparent decryption and encryption is really just who is the user? What keys do they have access to? Can I encrypt this for them? Yes, then encrypt it on the way down. Can I decrypt it on the way out? No, then they can't see it. Um, so we can do things like data masking through those type of mechanisms. So Real level. The way to think about this is like the existing Cassandra coordinator is just like, it's a, it's a hot, because you already have these, these features for the most part, right? So you're saying that the, the existing one is a hodgepodge of just like things grafted onto this yeah. ball of wax. And the idea is like, uh, let's have a clean architecture where we have this, this clear path to get to the data and the path to take the data out. And then yep. now you're, just, you're hooking in different services. Yep. Got it, okay. And then if, you, if the two green boxes on the top and the bottom, the, the coordinator service and the persistence service are really that is what essentially makes up the coordinator today. And then the one thing that we really want to do with this is give everybody on the planet that has a Cassandra cluster the ability to put C2 in front of their cluster today. So with a, with a Cassandra cluster the way it exists right now, you can actually run a Cassandra node in what's called a fat client node. And that is essentially just coordinator only. Um, and that, gives, that buys you a little bit of extra performance because it does separate some of the compute and storage. We just want to go like one level deeper and say, A, let's, let's make it clean so that we can put these abstractions in and everybody's not just trying to like slam these things into the OSS project as, as additions. And then B, how can we make this available for everybody running Cassandra today? And that's that's really what we're illustrating at the bottom with these storage shims is really you can use those storage shims to put C2 on top of any Cassandra instance, instance on the planet and modernize your, your input, even to the point where we're hoping we can get it back to Cassandra 2 and bring things like CQL back to a database that really doesn't have that at this point. And, and just give people a more modern way of, of interacting with Cassandra. So since you're running this from scratch, uh, or actually, I mean, I, I don't know how much of the, these components are, you're relying on the existing Cassandra code. Like, is, is, there, is, it, is everything written from scratch or, or is it leveraging existing infrastructure? It's leveraging existing infrastructure. Um, we're basing it off of the OSS 4.0 uh, okay. code base at this point. Our goal is to work through a set of refactors that really uses Cassandra as a library so we can bring in the stuff that we need uh, and run it run it in a less resource intensive manner um, than trying to start up a, a new version of Cassandra. So this is about a three week old um, effort at this point. Um, we're at the point right now where we can, we can make it work with the existing Cassandra. We have GraphQL working, we have REST working. It's clunky, um, but it, it's all coming together uh, and, and really getting to the point where we want people to be able to run Cassandra how they want to run Cassandra and, and not have to be experts on the system and really abstracting out the coordinator really allows anybody who can do basic servlet programming can build a new pipeline handler. 
and extend out Cassandra for their needs. Um, and that's about it. Um, just where we are and where we're going. Q3, we actually want to have multi-cloud um, in place so that you can actually run Cassandra between all the different clouds and actually move your, your workloads around if, you, if that's something that's important for you. And then, yeah, I just, Jeff, you want to take it away here? Yeah, totally. So uh, what I want to make sure is that you understood, I don't know, Jim probably said like free tier like a hundred times during the presentation, but this is for you. Like you can, if you want to get a free tier database that you can go play around with 10 gigs for free, you can sign up at astro.datastacks.com. That's, you know, for all of you that are live on the call, but also anybody is watching this on YouTube later on, uh, that's fine. Um, and for folks that are wanting to get up to speed, um, not just learning CQL, but also getting hands-on with these REST and GraphQL APIs and getting an understanding of what that looks like to interact with the database that way. We have a workshop series, um, like a couple hours at a time uh, for eight weeks. We're only on week two, or we just finished week two, so this is still something that people can jump in on. Um, and all the materials are available online. You can go back later on and watch the videos if you missed something. Um, so this is just like for anybody that's kind of interested in, in the learning aspect of this uh, and kind of getting leg up with some examples so you don't have to totally start from scratch um, kicking the tires on the database. We've, you know, we've got the example code and, and the stuff for you to get rolling on it. Um, so that you can ask us the hard questions like, you know, <laughs> I did this to my, to my uh, database, or uh, this is the experience that I had working with the REST API, what gives? Um, we want that feedback to, uh, to help us make the product better, so. Okay, awesome. Uh, so I will applaud for Jim and Jeff being here. Uh, does anybody have any questions before uh, we sort of wrap things up? So in the previous slide, you showed, okay, you support, you support GCP and, and AWS now. Can you roughly say what percentage of your customers are with GCP versus Amazon? And then of course, Azure is, is, is important. I understand, but, but you're not there yet. Yeah, there's, Mostly everybody is on GCP, just due to uh, uh, most folks at this point. We we did a formal GA in May, <clears throat> and so most of the folks that we have at this point are free tier users, and we deploy free tier exclusively to GCP at the moment. Um, we did that originally because GKE was free um, more for the for the uh, the Kubernetes masters, um, mm -hmm. so you didn't have to pay for an extra set of of nodes. Um, we've stayed there just because it, we know that it works. Um, and, and at this, at this point it's, it is free. So it doesn't really, for the most part, it doesn't matter that much. Um, we want to, we want to be able to provide free on all three of the database providers, but that's, <clears throat> we're really more focused on getting Azure working. Um, the commercial customers are about 40, 60, 50, 50 GCP and AWS. Okay. There is a lot of pent up demand right now for Azure. Um, okay. from our existing customer base. So we're really, we want to enable those folks pretty, pretty then, so, I, so I realize also too, you're on the cloud inf infrastructure team. Um, so you're not, you know, your, your team is not involved actively developing and improving Cassandra, um, or like the Cassandra runtime itself. But I'm curious to know like what metrics or what information can you provide? Are you providing back to that, to that Cassandra team about how people are actually using Cassandra. Because now you, you see everything, right? You, you know the queries are showing up. You know what sort of, you know, roughly what the data looks like. As, 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 I mean, maybe it's too early, but is there anything that you're providing to the, the Cassandra development team to say, okay, we see queries that look like this, you know, make sure we run those, right? You know, fix the system, system and run those things faster. Have you sort of had that kind of feedback provided to them yet or no? So we actually do have the the team that's working on the serverless development is all database engineers, and okay. so their their secondary project is really <clears throat> when we see things that we don't understand from the the cloud side, they're there to hold our hands through the whole Cassandra process mm -hmm. um, and what's going on there. The 
they work very, very closely with the Kubernetes team. Um, so the Kubernetes operator team is very tightly tied in with the metrics collection and reporting mechanisms. We don't actually look at folks' as queries um, specifically unless, unless we're running into a big problem. Um, and okay. then the customer gives us access to it and we'll go in and look at the queries. Um, just because somebody could say where social security number equals X and I just don't want anybody on my team seeing that at this point. At some point we'll have tokenized um, parameters, but we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have fed queries back. Well, the other thing we will do is actually just feed the, the metrics that are coming in. And so we'll be like, this cluster keeps, you know, the GC keeps kicking off on this cluster constantly. Do you know what's going on? And they'll look at the metrics and they'll look at the configuration and say, why don't you try this? And we'll try it and it'll go either, either be better or it'll be worse. Um, we, and we round and round until we come back to, oh, okay, we should probably deploy these clusters with X, Y, or Z, or we should probably put another guardrail around this to prevent that type of behavior from the user side of things and, and throttle it at the user end. That sounds very manual. It, it is, but every process, every process that ends up is what is the change we have to do? So either does it go into the operator or is it a new guardrail or rarely is it, rarely is it get the database engineers to fix something. Um, but it's, <laughs> it's definitely not, it's definitely not self-driving, right? Um, okay. It's, there is, we would, we would really, we have terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of database operational data. And at some point we're, we're looking to get the, the, uh, the, the capacity to be able to start to mine through that and see what are we looking for? What are, what are some of the anomalies that yes. we can look for? And then that, that command processor and command and control loop really becomes useful at that point. Cause we can just throw a message down that says, you know, change this parameter. And now we have a database that's bespoke for every one of our users. That is, that is definitely the goal um, that we'd like yep. to get down to. And then for the, for the stats you're collecting, I mean, the JVM spits out something, the database system spits out something. Kubernetes as well, do you find, um, like, do you guys, you guys ever use like Harbor, the Harbor performance counters from the CPU? Like, like you collect that kind of stuff or is it just sort of user level things? Mostly user level things. Um, okay. And Cassandra is pretty well instrumented at the JMX level. Okay. Um, one of the things that we did for, to enable the operators build this metrics collector that really pushes that information out in a collective fashion so we can push it into any any Prometheus cluster. Um, and that's actually how we, if you go into the interface today and click on stats, there'll actually be a Grafana dashboard that's every instance has its own version of uh, Grafana and Prometheus running to collect information and display it to you. We can also scrape all of that information off and, and perform, you know, there's a lot more metrics than we actually expose out mm -hmm. so that we can see what potentially is going wrong with the database itself. And is the level of, I realize we're over time, this is my last question. Is, is the robosity of those logs always the same or do you, do you recognize something's wrong, you maybe increase your sampling rate and then, and then do a further investigation? Uh, currently they're, they're all, it's, it's a standard sample rate. Um, it's, you know, it's usually about once every couple seconds or five okay. seconds. So it's not, it, it's usually good enough to understand what's going on. Um, with the running database. What we did is actually just crank the retention down so we can we can collect a pretty high granularity of, of data without overloading the box with just too many metrics. Yep, uh, okay. All right, cool, awesome. This is fantastic, this is, this is has been really interesting. Uh, so again, I thank Jim and Jeff for being here and sharing this with us today. Mm -hmm.